Good evening. So glad to have you all back today. Happy halfway through the weekday. What's the colloquial term we use for that? Yeah, happy hump day. <laughs> so, um, so glad that you cho decided to choose to spend your evening with us again tonight. Happy to have you all here, and I'm glad to be your host again tonight. My name is Meredith. Um, is there anybody here for the first night tonight, for the first time? Yes, welcome, welcome. So, um, did you register online? I'm not meaning to embarrass you. Did you did you get your free DVD, or did you ask about that? Not yet. Okay, be sure and do that, because <laughs> I think they might have gotten some more. If not, if they're out of them, they'll get you on a waiting list because you don't want to miss that DVD. It's really good. So we hope that everybody got that. And if you didn't, and um, you're still needing it, you deserve it because you registered the way they said you were supposed to, <laughs> then be sure they know and they have your name on the waiting list or you get your copy of that DVD. So um, I'm excited about the topic tonight, um, Hope for a World in Chaos. And when we look at the, the headlines, the news reports, we know that that's the way our world is right now, isn't it? There's no doubt about the fact that this world is in chaos. So what is the hope that we have for that? And so I'm really looking forward to that topic tonight. But before we go into our message for tonight, um, last night, if you were here, we added another little five-minute element in that we hope that you will appreciate. And that is a little health nugget because um, that's a very important aspect of our lives. And the Bible does have some things to say about that. So our presenter for our health nugget tonight is my friend Connie. So I will turn the time over to her. Thank you. Um, I'll add my welcome and happy Wednesday. Um, can I have that? <laughs> I might need that. But you know what? I'm seeing some kind of droopy faces out here. Everybody's looking a little tired. So let's see if we can change that. <laughs> Go back. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. I think that's so wonderful. We're changing here without uh, even touching it. <laughs> hmm? Oh, I see. It's different in the front than the back. Great. This is going to be fun. <laughs> okay, so we all know that we can go weeks without eating. You can go days without water, but you can only go a few minutes without oxygen. So the breath of life, it's so important. And I love this. Oxygen, it nourishes while it cleanses. How perfect is that? What else do we know that nourishes and cleanses at the same time? So the best air to breathe is oxygen rich negatively charged now you can find that in wonderful spots like this forests near rivers waterfalls god's natural wonderland i guess you could call it so negative ions are also called happy ions because they promote a sense of well-being 
and better moods. And the outdoors has 10 times the ch negative charged ions as indoors. I know, that's amazing, isn't it? The coolest thing is, though, we can create a little bit of that in our homes by having plants. You know, just pick something that has a lot of surface area, palms, ferns, lilies. So why are we starving for oxygen? If it's all around us, and we've breath been breathing all our life. Well, for one reason, we're doing it wrong. We're not breathing correctly. So I want us to try breathing correctly. Most people only breathe out of the top part of their lungs, even when they're exercising. Now, all you singers, I'm just going to ignore you because you know how to breathe. It's not a problem. But the rest of us, let's try breathing correctly. I want you to sit tall, roll your shoulders back, and kind of relax a little bit. And where's Pastor Tyler? Because I want him to do this breathing exercise too. So I want you to put one hand on your upper chest and one hand here at your lower ribs. I want you to breathe in slowly. You want to breathe at the bottom. You want to feel your ribs expanding before the upper chest. So breathe in. Count to like three or four. And then do the same thing, breathe out, but starting from the lower and pushing it out. Breathing out is as, as important as breathing in. So you guys just keep doing it so you can get the feel of it. The lower first, the upper last, and then bring in, breathing out the same way. Are you getting the hang of it? Can you feel it? Breathing out is is really important because like we said it cleanses the body so it's more important to breathe more counts out than in so you're really pushing all of that waste out of your system how are you doing a few people are looking a little perkier this is good the best thing about breathing deep is it not only will make you alert but it's also relieves anxiety, which is why I wanted Pastor Tyler to be doing this. You know, it's a good thing to do before coming up here. I was doing it a little bit myself. So how do you guys feel? Do you feel a little more alert than you did when you first came in? Okay, so anytime you're at your desk, if you're feeling anxious, take a few deep breaths. If you're feeling tired, take a few deep breaths. And it's like a mini vacation. And that's our health nugget for tonight. All right, we're going to do our drawing. If uh, I can get a registration person to bring me the... Uh, Linda, would you go and uh, ask them to bring me up the... We wait till the last minute so we get most people possible in there. Well, she's getting the names. I can show you what, we're, what we are drawing for today. It's a nice hardbound edition of a classic book on the life of Christ. This book is called The Desire of Ages. Beautifully bound edition of this book. Um, if you were here last night, we talked about Christ and his life to some degree. This is such an amazing book, um, considered by many, many uh, theologians to be their very favorite book on the life of Christ. So, thank you. Would you go ahead and draw one for me while you're here? I'll hold it. You, draw. <laughs> you can read it too because you have glasses on. <laughs> Jeff Hartz. Jeff Hartz. All right. Congratulations, Jeff. Yeah. All right. And. Um, did I miss any announcements? I hope everybody knows where the bathrooms are down the hall if you need it. If you ever need anything, please be sure to contact um, one of our people in the lobby. They'll be happy to help you with whatever your needs are. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the question box after the service. And um, we will also be having refreshments tonight. We'll announce that again at the end, something different for this evening. So before Pastor Tyler comes up to speak, you looking for the clicker? Here it is. 
<laughs> we do have some music for you. So um, Julie is going to share a song with us right now. Good evening. The song I'm going to sing is called In Christ Alone because I believe that he is the only thing that can get us through a lot of troubled times. So I really listen to what the lyrics say, um, and I hope it is meaningful to you also. In Christ alone will I glory, though I could pride myself in battles won. For I've been blessed beyond measure, and by His grace alone I overcome. Oh, I could stop and count successes like diamonds in my hand. But those trophies could not equal to the grace by which I stand. In Christ alone, I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone will I glory, for only by His grace I am redeemed. And only His tender mercy could reach beyond my weakness to my need. And now I seek no greater honor than just to know him more and to count my gains for losses to the glory of my Lord. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope. In Christ alone, I place my trust. And find my glory and the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me. My source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Is Christ alone? Is that a great song? Thank you, Julia, for singing that. I want to welcome you to Prophecies of Hope. We thank you again for joining us. And how many of you are enjoying these meetings that we're having here? Amen? Great, great. I am enjoying it too. And I'm glad that we can have time in our busy schedules to come together and take a rest from the burdens. And come together and pause and rest in the presence of God. Are you excited that we can do that? Amen. Me too. And what are some of the things that we've been talking about in our Prophecies of Hope seminar? Some of you are joining us from the, for the first time tonight, and I welcome you who are joining us. And we talked about a, 
metal image, a, a multi-mineral man, if you please, from Daniel chapter 2. Do you remember what that head of gold represented? Who can tell me? Babylon. And what was the chest and arms of silver? What was that represented by? Media Persia. And what about the belly and thighs of bronze? Greece. And them long legs of iron, what was that all about? Rome. And Rome, was it conquered from without? No, what happened to Rome? It got divided from within, that's exactly right, and it turned into these ten divisions of Rome, or modern Europe as we know today, the 21st century, correct? And that's the time in which we're living. And then we discussed the times in which we're living in the Signs of the Times presentation, and we, we talked about how everything that Jesus mentioned in the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter, came to meet its fulfillment. Except there's one thing left to happen, and who can tell me what that one thing is? The gospel going to entire world for a witness, and then Jesus' second coming. And that second coming of Christ was represented as the stone coming from out of the mountain without hands to smite the image at the feet. And then it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth, and that's God's everlasting kingdom. Are you excited that we can one day partake of God's everlasting kingdom? Amen. And I can see that, and I'm excited too. And I'm excited that we can all be there together if we desire. And that's why we talked about salvation last night. And we talked about that hope of redemption that lies only in Jesus. And let me ask you something, and, and I hope we know this. Is Jesus just a moral teacher? Yes or no? No, he's not just a moral teacher. Is he just some ethical philosopher? Yes or no? No, he's not. What is Jesus and who is Jesus? He's the Messiah and Jesus is the divine Son of God. Very good. So that's where we're at, and we'll be talking about other things, as you see on the screen, such as the rapture. How many of you have heard of a secret rapture? We'll be discussing that. Revelation's rapture. We're going to see what that's all about. We're going, to, we're going to settle that. And the mark of the beast. We've heard of the mark of the beast before, right? We've heard of this mystical number 666, and maybe some of you are wondering, what does that mean? And maybe some of you are saying, well, I know what it means, but we want to take the Bible out and put the Word of God to the test and find our answers right there, don't we? Because it's not about what we think, it's not about what I have to say, but about what the Word of God has to say. Would you say amen? We'll also be talking about who the beast is, this, this identity of the Antichrist power that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 and also in Daniel chapter 7. We'll talk even about the United States in Bible prophecy. Did you know that the United States is mentioned? Our nation is mentioned actually in the Bible. It's going to be exciting, an exciting presentation. We don't want to miss these things, and these are the foundations that we've been laying. But I have good news. Some of you are enjoying it so much that you're bringing friends, and I want to encourage that. It's not too late for you to bring a friend over here so that we can join our studies together. We have study guides that we can give out to catch them up. We're only on night number four, so we have enough time to keep these things going, and you have enough time to keep sharing the, the, the love with your friends and your neighbors and your loved ones and, and your coworkers, whoever else you would bring. Whoever desires, let them come and drink from the water of life that we're discovering in this Word of God. Tonight we're talking about the world in chaos, and we're talking about the solution to the world that's in chaos. How many of you think we need a solution for the world of chaos that we live in today? Amen. I do too. But you know what the main solution for us is going to be tonight? The solution for us is going to be the Spirit of God to be in our presence, in our midst, as we open the Word. Can we do that right now? Can we pray for the Spirit to be in our attendance? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much again, so much, Lord, for the privilege we have of studying your word. And Father, I, I'm thankful that we can be here together and we can share in this, this message of hope that you have for us this evening. The solution for the worldwide crisis, the solution for the pain and suffering, the solution for the troubles that we have in life. And Lord, we know that that is found in you, and that is found in your Son. But Father, reveal to us today the intricate details and why the world is the way it is right now. And if you are so good, then why is the world so bad? Please answer our question tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever asked that question before? If God is so good, then why is the world so bad? How many of you have asked that before? Or have thought that before? Or have heard someone say that to you? If God is so good, this God that you believe in, then why is the world such a terrible place? We're going to discuss that tonight. 
We have corporate greed in today's society. We have this, this uh, entities of, 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 of evil going on through war and through, through uh, human trafficking and, and through all sorts of, of evil. And when you turn on the news, you can, you can see some of these things. And we even find uh, things such as school violence on the rampage and, and senseless killings going uh, like extremely, extremely abundant in today's world. And, and why is that? It was not always like this, was it? We see violent acts on TV all of the time. Why has school violence exploded so much? We have this high-tech, media-savvy uh, society that, that uh, offers sexual content and offers violent acts and offers immorality on, on, on demand, if you will, on your smartphones and on your computers and on your TVs. It's like we live in a world where anything is accessible. Prime time viewing. We also find these things such as psycho trends that Dr. Sherbert Fraser uh, put out. Have you ever heard of that? He exposed these concerns that something is fundamentally wrong with our society as a whole. It's like we've been twisted because our moral standards are no longer rock solid as they once were. They're now free for anyone to decide what they think is best. And that's called secular humanism. Well, whatever you decide to do as a moral um, act, then that's fine, but what I do, I do, and, and you do what you do, and I do what I do, and we just get along and be friends. But is that possible in the world that we live in today? Is it possible that everyone just defines what their own morality is? Who really defines morality? Where do we find this concept? We find it in the Word of God. You know, this is a statistic. The average 18-year-old has witnessed, what is that number there? 200,000 violent acts on television and movies, including how many murders? 40,000 murders. The average 18-year-old is witnessing 200,000 violent acts and 40,000 murders. Is that something that you would like your children to be witnessing? Is that something that you believe is good for society today? Is that something that's going to be helpful to promoting peace and love and harmony and security in today's world? Watching 200,000 violent acts? Researchers reveal that the reality of the biblical truth, by beholding, we become changed. I took psychology classes in college, and they taught us this principle of modeling. And that principle of modeling pretty much deals with the fact that whatever you allow your mind and your thoughts to dwell on, those are the things that you're going to end up doing. Whatever goes in is what is going to come out in light of the mind. And the same is true in light of the physical as in the spiritual. So whatever you're feeding your mind is what you're going to be talking about and what you're going to be thinking about and what you're going to be expressing. So people may say, oh, well, I can watch violence and it doesn't affect me, or I can watch sexual immorality, it doesn't affect me, or I can watch thievery and all of these kind of evils, but it doesn't affect me, but it does. The Bible says by beholding, we become changed. You know, uh, research reveals this biblical truth as well. Uh, our society has turned its back on God's moral standards. We've seen this in statistics. We've seen this in news. We've seen this all throughout the world as we know it today. But do you know what was predicted originally? It was predicted in the Word of God. The Bible told us that these things would happen, and the Bible tells us how also we can prepare. Look at this text. It says, He who trusts in his own heart is a what, everyone? A fool. So if we throw aside the word of God and we say, hey, I'm just going to trust in what I think is right. I'm going to trust in my own mind as the standard. The Bible calls that foolish. Another biblical principle, one of my favorite books to read in the Bible is actually the, the book of Proverbs. It says, um, those who sow in the wind shall also reap the whirlwind. And this principle is, is one for us to, to take in tonight because we can find easily that the things that we do on a regular basis are going to simply affect us here and now. Now, you may say, well, I've been doing things my whole life and it hasn't affected me yet. Well, that can be said of smokers. And if we smoke cigarettes, maybe it's not going to affect you right away. It won't affect you the first cigarette or the second cigarette or the third. It might not even affect you the first five or ten years, but at some point, is that cigarette smoking going to catch up with you? Is some point that alcoholism going to catch up with you? Is some point that promiscuous behavior going to catch up with you? Absolutely. So if you sow in the wind, what are you going to reap according to the Bible? Says the whirlwind. 
It says the whirlwind. So how do we protect moral values in such an immoral world? How do we find protection from the world as we know it today? How do we find protection from the evil that exists in society today? How do we find it? How do you think? Can we find it in God's word, friends? Absolutely. So the book of Revelation actually reveals how we can find some of these things. It says Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9, gives us some historical context as to why the things happen the way they do in the world today. Why there's so much crime, why there's so much evil, why there's so much pain, why there's so much suffering. The Bible is very clear that war broke out in heaven, friends. Look at this. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But did they prevail? No, they did not, nor was a place found for them any longer. So that great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, his angels were cast out with him. You see, the devil had a master plan in heaven. The devil found himself to be beautiful because he was actually created as a perfect angel. Did you know that? Lucifer was created as a perfect being, the Bible says. When I discovered that in the, in the word of God, I said, wow, I, I always thought that God created a devil. But you know, the Bible tells us that God did not create a devil. He created Lucifer, but Lucifer made bad choices that then made him into a devil. You with me tonight? So he came up with this scheme that we don't need God. We don't need his, his, his word, his divine sayings. We don't need his wisdom. We can just do away with these restrictions that he calls his law or that he calls his foundation of love or his principles. We can put these things aside and we can be perfectly happy and perfectly in harmony by ourselves. Does that sound like today's world? It absolutely does. Hey, you do what you do, and I do what I do, and don't ask me, or don't judge me, or don't talk to me about what I do, and I won't talk to you about what you do. do you, have you heard that before? Well, that, that argument came directly from, can you guess? Came from Lucifer. It's exactly the same argument that he had in Revelation chapter 12. Verse 12 says, he did not prevail, that he was cast out, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea. Why do you think it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea? Friends, it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea, because the Bible tells us that the devil is as a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he may, running to and fro. Can you guess where? In the earth. The devil has a plan of attack, and that plan of attack is distracting you from having your mind set on God, from having your mind set on the Word, from having your mind set on divine principles so that you can pattern your character after God. Revelation goes on to, to warn us how this effect would then, would then uh, have action, direct action to Adam and Eve. It says the devil has come down having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. He was cast out and he came to the earth and he started deceiving God's created beings, Adam and Eve. Friends, there's a very real war going on a very real spiritual war behind the physical wars that we see on a regular basis. And what exists in natural war? What exists in, in modern war as we know it today? How many sides are there usually? Two sides. Opposing forces, maybe good and evil, maybe, maybe bad and good, maybe moral and immoral, who knows? But there's always two sides to the picture, isn't there? There's always two sides to have a controversy. And friends, there is a great controversy going on in the world today. If you say, well, I've never had a great controversy before. If you want to have a great controversy in your life, open the Bible. And I guarantee you, you'll automatically become on Satan's worst enemy list. How many of you want to be on Satan's worst enemy list? Amen. I'd like to see all the hands. Praise God. I remember when I, I raised my hand to a question very similar that was asked to me like that. Because... The devil is truly our enemy, isn't he? And I'd rather be an enemy of Satan so that I could be a friend with God. Can you say amen? And I know that you're friends of God, and I know that I'm friends of God, and I know that that's why we're here tonight, isn't it? Well, let's see what this God has to say. Let's see what the solution is, because they had to come up with a divine plan, a divine strategy, a plan of action to put a solution to this world of sin as we know it. And do you know what that solution is? It's John chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible tells us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This scripture tells us, first of all, that God is love. That he said, you know, even though my, 
My planet is a fallen planet, and my race is a fallen race. That, that perfect uh, being known as Adam that I created, and that perfect woman known as Eve that I created, they fell into sin, they made bad choices, but I am going to send my son to redeem them. He separated himself from everything that was dear in order to bring you back and to, to bring me back to harmony with God and his character. Are you happy about that? Amen. So God has a plan to win us back. And that's God's plan. His plan is to send Jesus with his sinful life and so that he can overcome the grave with his death and his resurrection and that he can overcome sin so that you can overcome, so that you can have peace and so that you can have favor and find mercy with God. So God's plan for Jesus was a sinful life to be the savior of the world. And God's plan for you tonight is to have Jesus in your heart so that you can overcome any temptation that the devil throws at you. Because if the devil hates you, then that would mean that the devil has a war against you, doesn't he? And that would mean that the devil has a plan to destroy you. And if he has a plan to destroy you, then that means God also has a plan to uh, save you and to protect you. So we're going to discover tonight how Satan has a plan to destroy us and what that plan is. I've got a hint for you. I've got some inside information. I've got the inside scoop on what Satan's plan is. So you want to discover that together with me tonight? Let's do it. Let's do it. Because we can know what Satan's plan is. And Satan does have a strategy. See, it's like a chess game. It's like he's the mastermind pulling the strings of the evil in this world, calling the shots of the world of darkness. And there's an opposing force that's trying to maintain the harmony of good and maintain the harmony of love and maintain the harmony of peace. But Satan is seeking to destroy. But does the Bible expose Satan's secret strategy? What do you think? Absolutely, the Bible exposes it. And in Daniel and Revelation, we find how this plan is exposed. Look what it says with me in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. It says, he shall speak words against the Most High. Now, who is this he in the text? This he, it, very good. Yes, someone said it, the little horn power. And what is that little horn? You might be saying, what in the world is the little horn? Well, that little horn is the Antichrist power that's mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation 13. That's the Antichrist that's going to be exposed. But this Antichrist is being worked through by the power of Satan, by the power of darkness to deceive. And what does it say he's going to do, friends? It says, he will speak words against the Most High. Some translations say great words. And great words better translates to mean blasphemy. So he's going to speak blasphemy, and he'll wear out the saints. Now, wearing out the saints is like an old English term. He wore them out, mate. And that basically means that he, he it's fully destroyed, or they, 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 they put him through the ringer, or, or he was firmly persecuted. That's what it means. It means that they were firmly persecuted persecuted by this power. So God's people would be persecuted by this Antichrist power is what it says, and that it would wear out the saints of the Most High. And what was the last thing that it says here? This is probably the most important. He would plan to change times and what? Law. Hmm. Times and law. What do you think the law is? What law is it talking about? Ten Commandments, you think so? Let's put that thesis to the test tonight. Satan indeed hates God's law. Do you know why that is? Because he hates God. Did you know that the law of God is a moral transcript of his character? It's a carbon copy of who he is. It's the written form of who God is. It's his character of love shown to the world. And do you think the devil loves God's character? Absolutely not. The devil hates God's character. Now, someone might ask, well, what is behind Satan's plan to change God's times and laws? And we're going to answer that tonight. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, for by the law is the knowledge of what? Of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And that's what we read in Romans 3, 20. And, and if you think about it, if we have the law of God, we then know what sin is. So if we don't have the law of God, what don't we have? We don't have the knowledge of sin. Do you think the devil wants you to have a knowledge of sin, or do you think the devil wants you to be a great sinner? He wants you to be a great sinner. 
And some of you are saying, well, I, I do very well on my own being a great sinner. And, and I agree with you. I do too. But do you know what? We have a greater Savior, don't we? But because we're great sinners naturally, does that mean that we want to remain great sinners? Absolutely not. So what is the key to overcoming our sin? That's our question. And what is the key to avoiding Satan's attacks? It says, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. So if you transgress God's law, what are you doing in biblical terms? You're sinning. You're sinning. So why does Satan want to remove the law of God and the knowledge of the law of God? Why do you think? So that he can cause you to sin. Very good. So he can cause you to sin. And here's the kicker. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Look what it says here. Powerful text. It says, the wages of sin is what? Death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, did you know that sin has wages? That's what the Bible's telling us, right? We can see that in the text. Sin has wages. Now, what are wages usually? We're working people, right? We, when we go and punch the clock, when we go and do some work, what do we usually get in return? We get a monetary increase, and that's a payment. Some people call it wages, correct? But it's saying the wages of sin is death. Notice, it does not say the punishment of sin is death. What did it say? The wages of sin is death. That shows us that we have a direct consequence to the violation of God's law. Did you know that God's law is a moral principle? It's, a, it's a, the foundation of love. It's the foundation upon which this world and, 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 and this creation was, was built upon. The foundation of love. Now, if God's law is a natural law, that would mean that there's direct consequences in violation. Who can tell me another natural law? Let's throw one out here. What's a natural law? Gravity. Oh, I like it. Gravity. That's a good one. Let's think about this for a second. The law of gravity. How do we violate the law of gravity? Well, I'm up on a platform, aren't I? What happens if I start beginning to step off this platform? What's, what's happening? I'm defying the law of gravity, correct? Because what goes up must come down. You know, if, if, if I jump off the stage, right? Jumped off the stage. Was anyone nervous when I did that? What if I were to tell you, you know what, I don't believe in that silly law of gravity. And I climb up on this church steeple, and I say, you know, I can fly. Because I read about that in comic books, and I've seen that on TV, right? So that means it's true because I've seen it on TV. So I'm going to fly. And I call all of us out here, and I say, okay, come and watch me fly. I'm going to be a spectacle. How many of you would want to see that? <laughs> well, good, because I'm not doing it. Why would you not want to see that? How many of you would be nervous if I climbed up on that steeple? Oh, good. That means you love me, right? And if I were to say, well, I don't believe you, because remember, a fool thinks that he knows what is right. So I'm a fool, and I'm going to say, no, I'm going to jump down because I don't believe in the law of gravity, and I'm not under that silly law. Does gravity really care? What's going to happen, friends? Gravity is going to bring me down and probably kill me. The wages of violating gravity is death. Please note, it's determined by the variation to which you break the law. If I step off of a four-inch curb, I'm, I may spring my ankle if I step off wrong, correct? But if I jump off of a 40-foot building, I'm going to have a direct consequence that's probably going to end my life. So to the degree in which we violate God's law is to the degree that we have the consequence of sin. But in the end, friends, the consequence of sin is death. Do we see why it's important that we keep God's law? Do we see why it's important that we take heed to the words written therein? Does it make sense? Is it logical? Right? Do you see how the law of God is actually something that can indeed protect us? It can protect us from the violation that sin causes. And the beautiful promise of that text is that the gift of God is eternal life. So we don't have to worry where in times past we have lived a life of sin because we're not going to be held as accountable in the day of judgment. And we'll talk about that as we continue moving on. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Satan wants people to remain in sin and find salvation and not find salvation and freedom in Jesus. So he knows that if he keeps you away from God's law and he keeps you away from who Jesus is and who God is in character, then he knows that he'll keep you in your what? He'll keep you in your sins. That's the very reason why he wants you to remain. Look what the Bible tells us about the law of God. It says the law of the Lord is what? Perfect, converting the soul. Some translations say reviving the soul. The very law of God brings life. But when you break the law of God, you're actually sowing seeds of death in your mind, in your body, and in your soul. I like death. How about you? I mean, I like life. How about you? <laughs> I don't like death. I don't like death. And Satan's trying to jumble up my words, isn't he? Because he hates that law of God so much. Look what it says in Romans. I want to show you this one. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, this is the Apostle Paul saying this in the New Testament. Because some may say, well, Pastor Tyler, that law of God is an Old Testament thing, and all that's been nailed to the cross. We're going to talk about that. Romans chapter 7, verse 7 tells us explicitly that Paul was able to know what sin was through a direct understanding of what the law was and what the law said. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 provides another solution. And it says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the what? On the earth. And where do we have the spiritual battle going on today? On the earth. So he's giving the solution, and that solution is found in what, everyone? In the gospel. And it's saying, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his what has come. His judgment has come and worship him. Notice this. It's not saying the judgment came before. It's not saying the judgment is coming. The Bible's saying that the hour of his judgment has come. Is that past, present, or future? This is present. The hour of his judgment has come. We are now living, the Bible says, in the time of judgment. So if we're living in this time of judgment, if we're living in a time in which we are going to be accountable to this uh, law of God and accountable with the gospel and accountable with the things that are going on today, then what side are we going to be on? That's what the Bible is challenging us with tonight. The Bible is saying, what side are you on? Friends, what side are you on? That's what Jesus is asking us tonight, and that's how Jesus is challenging us tonight. Please notice this. The judgment calls us to what for our actions? Accountability. This is a beautiful thing, friends. Accountability is good, isn't it? Some people that I've, I've talked to you about last night with, I've seen people overcome alcohol. I've seen people overcome tobacco. I've seen people overcome pornography and even prostitution. I've seen people overcome the worst of sins. But do you know how they overcame the worst of sins? Through Jesus. And do you know how they overcame through Jesus? Accountability. Oftentimes, if we look at some of these groups such as AA or NA or, or some of these things where, where people meet to overcome some of these struggles that they have, what do they find there? They find accountability. Accountability. How many of you have had accountability in your life? Firefighters have something called accountability. They keep each other straight that way. I have a very close friend who's a firefighter, and he tells me about this all the time, the accountability of his crew and the accountability of his team, and that's how they're able to overcome the problems that they face on a regular basis. Friends, you know that you can overcome the problems that you face in your life, and you can overcome them through the blood of the Lamb and through the accountability that he offers. Also, we can overcome through the accountability that we have in togetherness. What's that famous saying? United we stand, what else? Divided we fall. The devil wants to keep us divided. The devil wants to break us apart so that we don't have security, so that we don't have power and strength in numbers as we stand under the banner of Christ and call sin by his right name. The judgment calls us to accountability for our actions. And if, if I say, well, I have no responsibility because, you know, I've, I've, I've been bred into sin and, and it's hereditary and I can't overcome because, you know, after all, it's generational. And I, I, I've, I've done heroin because, you know, I was sexually abused as a child or I was, I was in, in, in and out of prison since I was young. So I just became a product of my environment and I'm a drug addict because I just, I just am and I can't overcome. And it's just the way I am. But is that true? Are we really not responsible for our actions? 
Are we really, a, 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 is someone a criminal because uh, they were made that way, because genetics made them that way? Is that how it works? You know, we live in a world where everyone says, it's not my fault. Hey, it's not me. I didn't do it. Hey, hey, I, I, yeah, I left a little late today, but if we didn't have traffic, I would have been there on time, right? Hey, uh, you know, I had enough money in my checking account when I wrote that check. It's not my fault it bounced. It's the bank's fault, right? Oh, hey, it's not my fault that I, I stepped on your foot getting into the elevator. Your foot shouldn't have been in the way. Don't we live in a world that says it's not my fault? It's your fault. But is it? Is it really not our fault when we sin? Have you ever heard that saying, the devil made me do it? Did the devil really make you do it, if you think about it at the end? Now, I'm, I'm by certain not going to be his advocate here tonight. I'm his adversary. I'm the adversary's adversary. Can you say amen? And you're the adversary's adversary when you take a stand for Jesus and you study his word. But I will tell you that when you sin, it is not the devil's fault. It's our own fault. You know, society that we live in largely says you're not responsible for your actions, but God's law is the basis of morality and the standard in this judgment. God's law is the solution. For this you know god's law is even the solution of selfishness when we have god's law we have an understanding of who he is and we have an understanding of his life of peace and his character of love that he's come to give look what revelation says revelation of scripture says so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the one law of liberty now this is an important statement judged by the law of liberty what does liberty mean Liberty is meaning that you're free, right? So actually keeping the law of God does not set you into bondage, but what does it actually do for you? It frees you. And what particularly does it free you of? It frees you of sin. I mean, let's examine some of God's commandments and let's see if these things actually make sense because I'm a logical person and I believe that you're logical people and we're here together and we're studying together and we're reasoning together and let's see if we can understand what laws are good that God has to say? Let's examine some of these. What about Exodus chapter 20, verse 13? It says, thou shalt not kill. Does this commandment liberate us? Well, yeah, it does. What, what if we did away with thou shalt not kill? What if we threw that one out? Hey, killing's absolutely okay. No more murder, murder trials. No more problems. Hey, guns, you want to have them? Go ahead, shoot it out, guys. Someone cuts you off, just shoot them. What if we lived in that type of world? Would that be a good thing? How many of you would want to live in that type of world? No hands? All right, let me put my hand down. What about another one that says, um, thou shall not commit adultery? Is that a good one? What if I say, well, you know, I'm not married, by the way, but let's say I was. I'm married, and I have a secretary. I say, hey, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, my wife is at home, whatever, but my secretary looks nice, and... We're both consenting people, and we're both adults. It wouldn't be a problem if I slept with her, would it? How many of you would think that would be a problem? Yeah. Funny how the hands go up. It is a problem. So what if we did away with that? What would happen to our families? What would happen to marriage? Would it be enhanced or would it be hurt? It would be hurt. It would deteriorate. Why? Because we're not keeping in harmony with God's law of love and putting others first. You know, the, the law that says you shall not commit adultery preserves the family from freedom of heartache, freedom from pain, damaged lives and damaged families, separated by divorce. Thou shalt not commit adultery is a very good commandment to have. It's a very good moral principle, life principle that we can have. How about the eighth commandment that says thou shalt not steal? How many of you have been robbed before or had something stolen from you before? All right. Is that a fun thing? Some of the hands just went right up, yep. I, I've been a victim of robber, robbery before. Do you think I was happy about that? Do you think I said, oh, this would be a great, this is a great idea. Thank you for robbing me tonight. You know what? I think that we should enact a law that makes robbery legal. Let's do that. Let's take it to Congress. Let's enact the law that says robbery should be legal. Because after all, since you couldn't get a job, it's better off you take the money that I earned at my job. Does that sound good? How many of you would want to see a, a, a world that has uh, thou shall not steal removed and, hey, stealing's okay? Would you like to see that world? Would you like to see a world that, that stealing is okay? No? So far, every commandment that we've analyzed tonight, every one that we've seen, 
we're all agreeing that we should have. Should we do away with any of these? So why is there a controversy over God's law? I wonder. Have you ever heard of this controversy over God's law before? Yeah. It's big in Christianity. Oh, you don't have to keep the law of God. Oh, who cares about the law of God? It's all about Jesus. And it's true. It is all about Jesus. But Jesus is the embodiment of God on earth, isn't he? Jesus is God represented in human form, is he not? Jesus is here to show us who God is, and the law is just a written transcript of that. Look what it says in Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. It tells us that we should worship God. So it also tells us that the judgment and that the law are part of the gospel. Do you see that? The text is very clear that his judgment has come and worship him. It tells us keep his commandments as well later on in that same chapter. So when the gospel goes out to the entire world, it warns the world of a coming judgment. But if the law is not valid, then why would God have to send his son? What would be the point? Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It says, Whosoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. See, the commandment of God was broken. Therefore, since something was broken, it had to be mediated or, or made remedial by the Son of God because sin is indeed breaking God's law. <clears throat> God's law is this eternal moral standard which defines sin and establishes our accountability. It's eternal. And the book of Revelation says you are responsible for your actions. The world says, oh, you're not responsible. It's not your fault. It's his fault. But the Bible says, yes, you are responsible for your actions. And what if our children, uh, what if they continue in this behavior of just watching violence and crime and, 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 and sexual immorality on TV? What's going to happen? Is that the diet that our children need to be feeding themselves? A diet of murder and a diet of, of violence and a diet of immorality? Is that what our children need to be growing up with? God's law is the pathway, pathway to freedom and genuine happiness. God's law gives you peace. God's law gives you love. God's law gives you joy in your heart. And love always needs to be led by obedience. You know, you're not obedient because of the law. You're not obedient in order to be saved. The law doesn't save you. The law points you to a savior, amen? Amen. And when the law points you to the Savior, then you find that need for God, and you find that understanding in Him, and you find that peace and that reconciliation. But some say, no, we don't need a law. Nope, that was done away with. Jesus fulfilled that when He went to the cross. But on the contrary, friends, John chapter 14, verse 15 tells us something different. Jesus Himself said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. That's how He put it. You know, we obey God not because in order to be saved, but because we are saved. That's why the law of God is important. That's why we keep it. Look what 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says. It says, know by this, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his what? Friends, why do we know him if we keep his law? Because the law is the character of God revealed. God, the law is the character of God revealed. The text goes on to tell us, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a what? A liar, and the truth is not him in him. What book of the Old Testament is this? It's not the Old Testament? It's the New Testament. This book was written actually after the crucifixion of Jesus. This book was written after the ascension of Jesus and Jesus saw it fit to keep it in the word of God that he who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. God's law and God's grace are not contradictory ideas. God's law and God's grace are more interchangeable terms. Salvation has always been by grace, but one may protest, no way. They were saved by grace in the New Testament, but they were saved by works in the Old Testament. But is that true? We can dig around and we can find some evidence to prove that it's not true. Look what this text tells us. Noah found what in the eyes of the Lord? He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was Noah saved by works or was he saved by grace, friends? He was saved by grace, but did that do away with his works? Absolutely not. So what is the role of grace in our life? 
The role of grace in our life is found in the text of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, by grace you have been saved through what? Faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So gifts, uh, uh, the gifts of grace are mercy and pardon and forgiveness and power and love. But does God's grace do away with his law? Is that what the Bible teaches? Absolutely not. Look at, look at this text in Ephesians 2.10. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good what? Works, which God prepared before and that we should walk in him. And some, some say, well, you know, if, if, if you're working, then you're working your way to salvation. You're not trusting God. You're a legalist. Have you ever heard that before? If you keep the law of God, you're a legalist. There's, 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 there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to demonstrate your love for God. But is that true? That's like saying, well, there's nothing I can do to demonstrate my love for my wife. We're already married, so I don't have to tell her she's beautiful. And I don't have to hold the door for her. And I don't have to make sure that she has her needs met and that she's feeling loved and feeling secure. I don't have to make sure of those things because, hey, it's not about works, it's about love. Does that make any sense? So why do we say that about God? I don't have to show my love for God by the things I do. I can just live a life of sin, even though Jesus went to the cross for me. Our sin is what put Jesus on the cross. Why would we want to do the things, the very things, watch and behold and act out and, and, and do the very things that put Jesus on the cross? What sense does that make, friends? Does that show that we have love for Jesus? Absolutely not. So it shows our love for Jesus. Look what it says here in Romans chapter 3. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Is Romans chapter 3 verse 1, what book of the Old Testament is that found in? It's not in the Old Testament? Man, I must have my slides messed up today. Or do we have a case that the law of God is relevant? How many of us see tonight that the law of God is relevant? And that it's something that we should consider? Good. You know, but again, I, I just... I have to give you another illustration. Now, how many of you have been in, in one of these situations before? You can be honest with me. You've been in this situation before, and you have the lights behind you, and oh, I guess I was speeding, right? And you're scrambling. You're trying to find your registration and your insurance and your license, and, oh, and the knocks on the window. Tuk, tuk, tuk. And, oh, hi, officer. Hey, well, oh, why, why did you pull me over? Do you know why I pulled you over tonight? Have you heard that question before? Do you know, do you know why I pulled you over tonight? Um, no, officer, why don't you tell me why, why you pulled me over? Well, I pulled you over because you were speeding. You were going 15 miles over the speed limit. What does that mean? That means we've broken the law. Is that correct? And I confess and I say, yes, I, I, I know. I, I, I was speeding and, and I'm sorry. I was late for an appointment. I was trying to get to work and I had traffic. And Okay, okay, I get it. You know what? I can see that you're a nice guy. I'm going to let you go free. By the way, if you're ever in a bind, um, maybe you're pulled over for speeding or something, crying works pretty good. <laughs> crying, crying can work. You might want to put, tuck that in your back pocket. But anyway, if he lets us go free, oh, friend, I'm going to let you go free. It's okay. I understand. I've been late to work before, too, and that's why I put my lights on and speed out and cut everyone off in traffic. But anyway, so he, he, they're saying, oh, I'll let you go free tonight, right? Let you go free. What are we now under? We're under grace. So how do we act when we're under grace? No, come on, guys. Live a little. You know what we do? We floor it. We say, I'm late for an appointment. I got to get out of here. And we floor it and we get gravel all over the policeman's car and we fishtail out of there and we speed. We don't go 15 miles. We go 25 miles over the speed limit because we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. Is that what we do? So why do we do that with God? Why do we say, God, we're not under law anymore, we're under grace? Look what Romans chapter 6 says. It says, what shall we then say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? What does the apostle Paul tell us? God forbid. God forbid. Well, sometimes we can have a mistaken idea that Jesus' grace did away with God's law, but did it? Look what he says in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law of the, or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. That means to fill to the full. But let's reword that. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to do away with it. Does that make sense? 
That's what we say, though. That would be like a thief saying, uh, I didn't come to rob you, I just came to take everything you have. It's illogical. The law of God has not been done away with. The law of God is something that protects us and establishes us in the faith and keeps us on the straight and narrow. It's like, it's like um, uh, what are those things called when you're, when you're driving up a mountain? What are those things called along the side of the road? Come on, help me out. Guardrails. Thank you, Meredith. Guardrails. Okay. You know, I was in Northern California, and there's, there's mountains. How many of you have been to Northern California before? Okay. How many of you have seen mountains before? This is a dumb question, isn't it? I'm from Florida, so it gives you some context. And in Florida, we don't see too many mountains. Florida is a flat piece of land. You might see a hill, but it's about this, this tall. When I went to Northern California, I saw mountains, and I said, whoa, those things. Are... And some people, oh, you didn't see mountains, you saw hills. Okay, fine, but it's bigger than anything I've ever seen. And I was with this guy one day, and we were, we were driving, and I guess he was feeling himself a little bit, and he was in his car, and he was, he was pushing it, you know. And we were going around these, these, these hills, what I call mountains, and I was terrified. Why do you think I was terrified? I said, please slow down. Please don't whip around the corner. Oh, no, no, I'm used to driving like this. And I wasn't used to driving like that. And we're riding around this, and the only thing I could say is, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the guardrails. Because at least if he crashes into it, we probably won't go torpedoing off the cliff, although we may. Were the guardrails there to protect me or to prevent me? Which one? They were there to protect me. They were not there to hinder me from having a, a, a hang gliding experience. I didn't want to go hang gliding in the car that night. I wanted to be safe and sound and brought to my destination. That's what the law of God does for us. It keeps us safe. It keeps us protected. It keeps us in the straight and the narrow so that we don't get off and experience the, what the Bible says as the wages of sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, here's the thing. Let's look at this again. What does it mean to be under the law? Let's examine this, okay? What does it mean to be under the law? It, it means that to be under the law is not a means of salvation, first of all. In other words, we cannot be saved by a keeping of the law. We cannot be saved by keeping the commandments. And let's see what it means to be under grace. What does that mean? To be under grace means we come to the cross. To be, to be under grace means we come to Jesus and we, we bring our burdens to him. When we come to Jesus and we throw ourselves at his feet, do you know what he says? My child, no matter what you have done, no matter how far you have gone, it's okay. I love you. Come home. I don't know where you are in light of your relationship with Jesus tonight, but he's telling you, friend, come home. It's time. I want you with me. Because I want you with me for eternity. The law of God reveals our need. When we look at the law of God, we see who we are. It's a mirror pointing us to our need. Now, I often give this uh, illustration to, to, um, to children when I, when I study the Bible with them. And I say, you know, if we had something dirty on our face and we go to the mirror, what does the mirror do for us? It shows us. It diagnoses our condition. Now, because I don't look so good in the mirror, because I have chocolate cake smeared on my face, do I get upset and break the mirror and try to alleviate it that way and just walk away? Is that what I do? What do I do as a result? I go clean myself up. So that mirror points me to my need of water, a remedial agent to cleanse me of what I have on my face. The law of God points you to Jesus so that he can cleanse you from your sin. You know, one lawyer in Jesus' time tried to catch him. He said, what is the great commandment of the law and, and what should we do in order to be saved? And look what he says here. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he goes on to say, if we can get this slide over, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he's telling us clearly that the commandments of God are relevant and on the commandments of God hang the entire law and the entire prophets and they can be summarized in one word. And what is that word, everyone? Love. Because the law of God is all about the law of love. It can be symbolized and summarized into that one word. Love God and love your fellow man. 
The first four commandments deal with your love for God. The last six deal with your love for your fellow man. The last six help you to live in harmony with society. Remember what we were doing earlier? If we take away any of those commandments that we cited, what happens to society? It begins to crumble. And that's exactly what's happening today. The law of God has been lost sight of, so there's no standard of morality. Where was the law of God given? At Mount Sinai. What was the only part of the Bible that was not inspired? The Ten Commandments. Why was the Ten Commandments not inspired? Yeah, you see? Because God himself wrote it. Now, if anything should be changed in the Word of God, I don't believe anything should be changed in the Word of God. Would you agree? I think we should keep the Word of God as it is. But if anything shouldn't be changed... I would say the commandments should not be changed. That was the only thing that God himself wrote. Do you think it's wise to change something that God himself wrote with his own finger? Do you think it was important that God wrote something important for us? Yeah, I do too. So keeping God's law doesn't put us in bondage. It takes us out of bondage. Exodus chapter 20 verse 2 says, I am the Lord Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of what? Bondage. That's the bookend of the Ten Commandments. And the last one says to offer a sacrifice, and that's pointing to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall be my people. How many of you want to be the people of God? The people that know him and that have his character represented. It says, Revelation 14, verse 12, how we can be a part of those people. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the what, friends? commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The people who are going to be ready to meet him when he comes are going to be the people that have his character represented and reproduced in their lives. The people of God. This is exactly how it describes it in the last days. Blessed are those who do his what, friends? Commandments that they may have right to the tree of what? Life. And that they may enter into the gates of the city. How many of you want to enter into the gates of the city? Well, you know what Jesus is saying tonight? Jesus is saying, come to me, my child. Come and have a better understanding of who I am. Have a better understanding of my character of love. Have a better understanding of my plan of redemption. Have a better understanding of my character so that you can be prepared not only to live in the last days without fear, with hope in his mercy, but also to be ready to meet him when he comes. How many of you want to be ready to meet him when he comes? Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to think about these things. I want you to go home and and study and pray and think about the the commandments of God. And if you have any questions, we want to invite you, please put them in our question box and we'll we'll come up and and, and we'll, we'll discuss those things. Some of you may have a question that others have too. So there's no shame in doing that. But Christ has something special for you. And that special thing for you is his plan of redemption and salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the salvation that's offered in Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness that you've given, the pardon and the mercy that your grace offers us. But we thank you, Lord, for also giving us a law that protects us and that keeps us safe, that is not a burden to us, but actually a blessing, that provides life and peace, and that restores our soul, that points us to Jesus so that we can have truly a cleansing from our sin and a new life in Christ. We pray that we will give that law another chance, that we will look at it and we will see, is there anything in that law that should be done away with? And Father, we pray, Lord, that you will continue being with us as we meet night by night and continue blessing our studies and our fellowship together. I ask that you will be with my friends in a very special way and keep them safe on their ride home. And bring us here again, come Friday night, for we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, on that, I just want to announce just one thing before you go. Uh, Friday, we're going to discuss Revelation's Day of Hope. Please don't miss that. It's a very important topic. Also, Saturday, we'll talk about history's greatest cover-up. And then Sunday, Revelation's secret to a whole new life. We do have a song, don't we? No? Okay. So I'll just invite Meredith to come up, and I'll be at the door. I'd like to be shaking your hands and getting more acquainted with you. So please, come meet me there. I just wanted to remind you 
um, that we have refreshments um, tonight, something a little new. Somebody's got something special for you. Out in the, if you go through the church lobby into the next little lobby area, I think that's where it's set up. So if you'd like to stick around and get acquainted with the people who are attending and uh, just have a time of fellowship, we invite you to do that. Study guides are at the door, and please leave your questions in the box, and we'll see you on Friday night. Enjoy your night off. Good night.